the Grand Seiko, I mean, it's this, the snowflake. Uh, I've always loved this watch. The spring drive is something that uh, really fascinates me because I was reading about how many years into development was mm -hmm. before they were actually comfortable releasing it. And the movement of that second hand so smooth. Yeah. It's, you know, only if you're into watches you understand totally. the feeling. Massimo Frischella, thank you for joining us, first off. It's a pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are and what you do here? All right, so we are in, um, in the heart of the Jaguar Land Rover design studio. Mm -hmm. So here is where we design all Land Rover and all Jaguar vehicles. We just very recently, in the last year, uh, we have introduced two major vehicles, the new Range Rover mm -hmm. and the new Range Rover Sport. Mm -hmm. We also introduced very recently the latest uh, addition to the Defender family, the, the 130. So you are the man responsible for bringing back an icon, the Land Rover Defender. Something that old with so much legacy and history tied up, it's so close to people's hearts. And really it hadn't changed in quite a long time. Exactly, but that's, that's the thing, you know, it is about acknowledging the past, but it's about looking forward all mm. the time, you know, evolving what we're doing, staying true to our DNA, but, you know, evolving to become relevant, to stay relevant in a, in a world that is changing fast. So this is an interesting jumping off point, and I'll pivot to watches. Watches on the table, like the Royal Oak, the Daytona, the GMT Master, we love them because they haven't changed. But yet we're talking about we need to stay relevant. Do you think the same sort of philosophy from the car world can apply to the watch world or is it the opposite? No, I think you can apply if you think, you know, let's look at the Submariner. Um, you know, it, it's clear the lineage, the evolution of the Submariner is a true Submariner. Right. You can see from the first generation of Submariner, but now you have a ceramic uh, bezel. You know, it's that level of uh, implementation of technologies and material that makes it more relevant to uh, a world today. So that's a perfect example, but it is the parallel with the automotive, you know, mechanical mm -hmm. devices. You know, there's the human genius in creating, you know, different scale, different size, something that can work for a long time. You know, watches, if you look after them, they can work. Yeah, they'll outlive us. Yeah, so there is that parallel. Uh, and I like the fact that um, they're both there to do a job, right? There's a function behind, but ultimately they become object of desire, mm -hmm. right? You just see them and you just, you just want to have them. So let's actually jump right off and talk about uh, the watch that started it all. Oh, okay. So my first watch was the Tag Heuer Kirium, which I bought like over 20 years ago. And uh, at that point, I was actually a bit like, gosh, why, why would I spend $600 on a watch? You know? Right, yeah. I, I was at that level. Yeah, right? of course. And I wore that watch every single day for like uh, about 10 years, maybe a bit longer. In the beginning of your career? Yes. Wow. Until... I went to the watch that actually started everything that you see uh, today. Um, so this watch was, uh, I, I did like that watch, the, the design, the proportion of it. I know it now is, is a little bit uh, particular uh, yeah. given the today's standard. But I like the integration of the rubber into the, the mm. casing and the lugs. And I believe, um, the, the designer of this watch, uh, his name is uh, Jörg Heisek. He's a German designer. I think he's the same designer uh, who designed the Vacheron Constantin 222. Mm, yeah. And, yeah. you know, if I stretch my imagination, I can almost see some uh, similarities in, yeah. the, in the execution of the bezel, at least. But this was a jumping off point to the next watch that kind of, you took the point. Yes, right. So th that's the Panerai, uh, the titanium mm. um, Luminor. We're talking about eight years ago now. Yeah. My wife said, oh, when uh, you get your promotion, I, you know, I am from 
Marina di Massa, a, a small village in Tuscany, not far mm. from Florence, about an hour ago, uh, from, uh, from Florence. And uh, she said, once you get your uh, uh, promotion at work, we'll go to Florence, the Panerai boutique, wow. and we'll get a Panerai, right, yeah. to, to celebrate the occasion. Ultimately, I want something very simple, the Luminor, very iconic with a crown guard. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the end, I had to decide between the one that I uh, went for and the very simple one, the, very, the base one. Right. And I remember one uh, of the lady at the store said, I would get this one because you know you have the second hands mm -hmm. and it gives you a sense of movement. You can see the watch. Right moving yeah, right in motion and that's why i went for that and it, it, this is a watch that i am particularly attached to. and it's it's fitting for uh for an italian to to start of with course i you yeah. know i had to start with an italian yeah. watch right <laughs> so you started with the panerai and there's also another italian watch on the table here this unimatic <laughs> what's the story behind this one this particular unimatic has a, a really strong connection uh with me because i have been in the army for uh, almost two years, just over two years, wow. in, uh, back in the days, uh, mm -hmm. early, early 90s now. Um, and I was in, uh, in a division of the army that is called Alpini, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically um, has its service along the, the Alps, wow. right? protecting so the border, Italy. yes. Okay. So this watch is celebrating that division, yeah. uh, Alpini, you know, they're very uh, famous in Italy for wearing this hat with, uh, with a feather. And uh, for me that when this came out, you know, being a collector of Unimati in some form, uh, I said, oh, I can't believe this is just the perfect yeah. match for me. So I, I so you served in that I that, served that, that yeah. I was an officer. Wow. It's a long story, but that helped me to, uh, you know, because uh, you would get paid, not not just like a normal soldier. Right. And that was a mean for me to afford later on the design school. So it's mm -hmm. not like I necessarily wanted to be in the army, although I really enjoy every minute of it. Of course, yeah. Uh, it was just a great experience. So this watch kind of celebrates that. The first watch that really caught my attention as I was, you know, researching, it was the, the Mark 11. Mm. For me, the Mark 11 yeah. has a quality to it that is, um, you know, it's just unique. That simplicity, uh, the clarity, the yeah. lack of ornament, it, it's just, you know, the, the raw finish and, uh, you know, the, the way the hands are. And uh, it, it's there's something about this watch that really caught my attention. Uh, so I was able to find one through an auction. Uh, mm -hmm. This particular Mark 11 has uh, uh, what is called the Hooked 7, which is a particular version of, of that dial. This is from 1952 wow. and the condition is incredible. I do like that is you can still see some sign of, you know, past experiences, right, yeah. but you know, it, it's, it's in a wonderful condition. So this one led actually to uh, and now this watch has a, a, the famous caliber 89. Mm -hmm. yeah. and this uh, led to the next watch that I purchased, which is uh, a very different character. Yeah. Uh, still IWC. And uh, for me, the execution of the dial with that sort of gray bluish color, it gives that enough edge that you can wear it in, in any occasion. Yeah. And again, it's got that wonderful caliber. Yeah, if you look at it from that point, that they both share the caliber 89, but the design expression is very different, yeah. but ultimately similar in the fact that they're very simple. Yes. Yeah. And simplicity is, is a theme that is very recurrent. Um, but then there are a few watches here that ac actually are connected to event mm -hmm. work, personal, and uh, you know, like for instance, this Royal Oak, which has always been a holy grail. For me, it stands for everything that, you know, what design should be, you know, mm -hmm. it's got that very sort of robust, sophisticated uh, approach, this uh, honesty, incredible character, so distinctive, so simple at the same time. It's, it's about the proportion, but it's about the details. I mean, th this is just a, a, a piece of art before it is a watch. Yeah. Uh, and the story here, we went to Geneva to launch the Range Rover Velar mm -hmm. in 2017. 
And I remember I was with a friend uh, and said, well, since we are in Geneva, I would love to go to the Audemars Piguet boutique mm. and see if I can put a deposit on a Royal Oak. And then as I was walking around the store, I recognized that reference because of the AP at six o'clock. So I called the, the lady and said, is this for sale? And uh, she looked at me and said, uh, well, if it's here, it is for sale. <laughs> so from going there to put a deposit, I ended up walking out. It. Yeah, with walking watch. out with it. And and this one is also tied to a car watch. Correct. The big pilot is the watch that celebrate the defender, and clearly the similarities in uh, yeah. in, in spirit. This so is a speak. 110 or 130. This is not a 90 on, on the wrist, <laughs> that's for sure. No, actually the, the Mark 11, that's the 90. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. The, right. the 90 here, and this is the so extended the Mark, wheelbase. Correct. Yeah. So that's the 110. Uh, but yeah, the spirit of Defender, you know, is there this sort of a very honest, purposeful watch. Um, you know, I, I love the proportion, love the crown. I mean, how can you not love this watch? This is something that, uh, again, it really caught my attention in the early days of start looking at watches and uh, pairing it with, with Defender, I thought it was just perfect. And there's one Grand Seiko on the table, but it's not the Grand Seiko that most people know, the, the most modern iteration of Grand Seiko. This is one that's signed Grand Seiko at six o'clock and Seiko at 12. Yeah, the Grand Seiko, I mean, it's this, the Snowflake. Uh, I've always loved this watch, but when I found out that there was a new one coming out, removing the, the Seiko uh, wording at the top and just having Grand Seiko, I initially felt, hmm, the dial feels a bit unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So I need to find a way to source one from the earlier generation. So I start calling around pretty much everywhere. And uh, eventually through a colleague who works in Tokyo, I managed to find probably what is the last one from the boutique in uh, Genza. Wow. And then incidentally, this colleague was flying over to England two weeks later for a convention. So I said, well, it's a sign. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sign. Gotta do it. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I just think that this is a phenomenal watch. Um, the finish, you know, titanium, the level of uh, details on, on the hands, the mm. sharpness, the reflection, the dial itself. I'm reading it's like six layers of paint to achieve mm. the texture that simulates the snow. And uh, the spring drive is something that uh, really fascinate me because I was reading about how many years into development was mm -hmm. before they were actually comfortable releasing it. And the movement of that second hand so smooth. Yeah. It's, you know, only if you're into watches you can understand <laughs> the <Totally>. feeling. <laughs> I think it's almost a universal appeal to watch something yeah. so precise and almost so perfect. What I think is most interesting that you said is that you prefer the balance that this uh, being signed Seiko and Grand Seiko, because obviously they're moving away from that direction, right? So this is a very specific era. And to hear from a designer's perspective, yeah. that there's a certain balance that's achieved. That was the first thing that uh, I have to say that I learned to like the new one as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but I think at first for me it was something missing. So it, mm. it did feel unbalanced and that's why I wanted to go trying to find the, uh, the older one. Speaking of balance, hmm. the 1016 Explorer. This is, I mean, you can put this thing on a scale and it'll balance, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the watch, you know, it's Rolex essence. Talking again about the simplicity. I love all Explorers. Uh, I love the new ones, but this just happened again. Uh, I was in uh, on holidays in um, my hometown. Mm. Um, in Tuscany, and uh, I met uh, this person, uh, Maurizio De Angelis, who was, was a friend. He found this watch for me, and I just had to have it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and this is a watch that I truly enjoy wearing. Again, is is that I I, lo I love the fact that it's 
so straightforward. You know, it's it's about being authentic. It's not about being uh, with ornaments or giving something that is superfluous. It's about this is what it does. It's a tool watch. So there is a watch that I found on uh, uh, Instagram. Some don't remember uh, the name of the person, but posted this watch for sale. I got in touch with him. Um, then I found out about the history and uh, the, the link with the, the Olympic Games right. um, in Tokyo. And I just love the mono pusher uh, concept of the, of the chronograph. Again, it's a testament to how many beautiful Seikos uh, there are, and uh, particularly for, from these era, the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. there is so much to, you know, to fall in love with, really. And this is one of them. And there is another watch that we can't ignore. We didn't talk about this one yet. We didn't. Well, first of all, this is a gift from my wife for mm. my 50. And it was also, let's say, wrapped it together with the launch of the new Range Rover that wow. happened. Uh, right. within a couple of months. And it's a watch that I absolutely adore. I love the Aquanaut, but mm -hmm. this particular re reference, I love the symmetry, uh, the balance again in the design of the, the casing. I love the quirkiness of some of the details of the textures on, uh, on the dial. And I just love the functionality of it. I think yeah. it's very clever, you know, the, the mm -hmm. hand when you, when you travel and uh, disappearing under the uh, the home hand, I think it's incredible. Yeah, a little, little magic trick. Yeah. And lastly, there's a watch that I wanted to save for the end to ask you about. And that's the watch on your wrist. Oh. Yes, the watch on my wrist is actually the last, the latest edition. Um, so this is a weekly calendar, mm -hmm. Patek Philippe. It was brought to my attention a few months ago, and I really liked it. But when I first saw it in person, I had a very different mm. perception of the watch. And I loved the handwriting. I loved the bohemian sort of touch to something that is so classy. Mm. Right? So this is a color travel, but the handwriting takes an edge of the formality of a color travel. Mm. The two hands that uh, point at the day of the week or the week mm -hmm. of the year with the you know the hammerhead in red it just pops into the dial there's something quite magical about this mm. watch um, yeah massimo it's been an honor and a pleasure i've learned so much about the defender which i'm personally interested in and your incredible collection you've amassed a crazy amount of watches in such a short amount of time and i'm very excited to see what's next Thank you for having me here. It's been a pleasure um, talking to you and sharing uh, my passion about watches and uh, where it's going next. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what's coming next and we'll see what uh, will be out there to celebrate those events.